Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right? Perfect. Um, so my name is Eva Yusonite. I am the Watson Family University Associate Professor of International Security and Anthropology. And uh, I would like to welcome you all to this event, um, both of you who are here and those watching online. Uh, and I will be moderating this event. Uh, in, in the opening lines to his book, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnamese American author and scholar Viet Thanh Nguyen wrote, all wars are fought twice, the first time on the battlefield, the second time in memory. As we are marking the end of the 20 year long US war in Afghanistan, it doesn't yet seem that it's slipping into memory. We are reckoning with the legacies of this war, its failures and successes, its profound impact in shaping our lives. We are writing and rewriting the narrative of the war on terror, counting bodies and dollars, quite uncertain whether it is accurate to say that this war is over, that it is now history. And what does it even mean for the war to end? What would it mean for the US to win or lose war? Not battles, but the war that has no boundaries. In the post 9-11 world, what exactly is war? Is there anything outside it? It is clear that wars are not limited to the front lines, but extend to societies at large, undermine democratic values and human rights norms, exert enormous toll on veterans and their families in the US and in allied, allied countries, uh, and perhaps even more profoundly affecting people who live and flee from places where US wages its wars, covertly or not, deploying troops and sending drones, um, interrogating captives or surveilling the population. The war has human, social, economic, political costs that are so vast, it, vast, it is difficult to grasp them all. And uh, like COVID-19 pandemic that may seem to be over, but is not, the war continues even when um, it legally hides under the banner of peace, out of sight, out of mind. So this panel uh, organized by the Costs of War Project is a timely daring attempt to take stock, to look backwards and forwards into the post 9-11 American war, its accumulated costs and its precedents for the future to come. You'll hear from four panelists who have studied war and its social, political, and economic impacts from various scales and perspectives. Uh, first, you will hear from Nita Crawford, who is a professor and chair of political science at Boston University. She's the author of several books, including Accountability for Killing, Moral Responsibility for Collateral Damage in America's Post-9-11 Wars, and Argument and Change in World Politics, Ethics, Decolonization, Humanitarian Intervention. Dr. Crawford is one of the Costs of War Project's co-founders and co-directors. You will then hear from Nadia Al-Ali, who is Professor of International Studies and Professor of Anthropology and Middle East Studies here at Brown University. She has published a number of books on women's and gendered mobilizations in the Middle East, most notably, What Kind of Liberation? Women and the Occupation of Iraq, and we are Iraqis, aesthetics and politics in a time of war. Heidi Pelletier is assistant research professor in the Department of Political Science at Boston University and the project director of 20 Years of War, a costs of war research series in partnership with the party uh, center at Boston University. Dr. Pelletier has served as a consultant with the US Department of Energy, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and the International Labor Organization. And last but certainly not least, Stephanie Savell is a senior researcher at Brown University's Watson Institute for International Public Affairs, 
and co-director of the Cost of War project. Dr. Savell is an anthropologist who has done extensive research on policing in Brazil and is co-author of The Civic Imagination, Making a Difference in American Political Life. Her current work focuses on US war on terrorism, and she's the one that put, who put this event together. After the panel, we will have uh, time for the audience to ask questions, both live and uh, on YouTube. I'll be monitoring um, the comment section. So, but we will begin first with uh, Dr. Crawford, who will present us the latest updates and figures from the Costs of War project. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for doing this and um, uh, Stephanie for putting it together. I'm just gonna give a quick, I'll take off one of my masks. I'll just give you a quick um, summary here of the Cost of War project writ large and then dive in on a few things and sort of give you the context of the Cost of War project's larger goals. Um, okay, so the project began here under the wing of Catherine Lutz with the support of Aaron Belkin and the Watson Institute at large, dozens of scholars from a range of disciplines, journalists, physicians, lawyers. Uh, some of them wrote one piece. Some of them were recidivists, repeat offenders, writing several short analyses of the cost of war. And the project's process is to have people write papers. And if we can, we gather in person and workshop the papers. And then uh, some of the papers aren't done that way and that's uh, less of a peer review process, but nevertheless, they are reviewed. The whole effort is not possible without the staff of the Watson Institute, including Ellen, who I've known 20 years, thank goodness, Ellen White, uh, and others, John Mazza and so on, Rethink Media, Darcy Rakestraw and Elizabeth Beavers, um, and of course the tireless efforts of Stephanie Savell. So the aim of the project is to inform, to paint the big picture of the cost of war. Um, it's it's gonna answer some questions, but it leaves others not answered because they're not answerable. So there's sometimes questions we don't have the answers to. So anniversaries and endings recall beginnings. A year from now, we'll likely be recalling the fall of Afghanistan and the evacuation of 123,000 people. As Ralph Ellison wrote, the end is in the beginning and lies far ahead. He was perhaps echoing T.S. Eliot's phrase, what we call the beginning is often an end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from, which recalls the quote that you began with, which is where do wars begin and uh, where do they end? On 9-11 and in the days and weeks after, about 3,000 people were killed, of course, and many thousands more were injured as the direct consequence of the Al-Qaeda attacks. And many still suffer from the smoke that they inhaled when they rushed to help and the trauma that they experienced as the witnesses and the family members of those who were harmed. Polls taken in the US immediately after the attacks of September 11th and over the next several months found that many Americans, even those far from lower Manhattan, Washington DC and the Pennsylvania crash site where, where one of the planes landed were fearful. A Gallup poll for CNN and USA Today, taken on the day of the attack, found 58% of Americans interviewed were, quote, somewhat or very worried about being victims of another terror attack. Also on that same day, 71% of those polled said that they felt depressed by the attacks. About a month later, 37% said they were nervous or edgy because of the attacks. A national survey reported in the New England Journal of Medicine also found high rates of distress. Of those adults questions, just a few days after the attacks, 90% reported at least a low level of stress symptoms. And 44% said that they had experienced at least one of five substantial stress symptoms since those attacks. There was also abroad in the United States, the feeling that terrorism would continue. 
21% said they thought terrorism would remain at the current level. And 44% said they thought it would increase over the next five years. And while the sense of personal threat declined over the months following the attacks, even with the anonymous anthrax mail attacks on Congress and news organizations, confidence in the US government's ability to protect its citizens from future terrorist attacks fell. So that's where we began in fear and anger. Now the US has ostensibly ended one war in Afghanistan, but as President Biden reassured the American people, the tentacles of our military operations continue, continue to reach not only into Afghanistan in an over the horizon strategy, but the US has troops, advisors, drone strikes, covert operations and counter terror funding in dozens of nations across the globe from A to Z. Well, at least from Afghanistan to Burkina Faso, to Iraq, to the Philippines, Yemen and elsewhere. Blood and treasure. It often seems easier to focus on one or two facts, sometimes in isolation, as a stand in for the whole, like those figures of speech that poets call synecdoche, where an aspect of the thing, a part, is used to represent the entirety of something much more complex. So the president, or any president, has said that the cost of war is the amount of money Congress authorized. The Pentagon, or the number of US soldiers who died becomes a stand-in for the human toll, the blood and treasure. Words then fail us in grief. So here we see if you, I don't know if you could dim the lights just a hair. Here we see the extent of this war on terror. And this is the map produced by Dr. Savell and hoping she'll talk about it later. Um, which gives us the extent of it. But this is the reaction that I, of fear, the sort of, uh, it, it's, we think of Afghanistan and Iraq as the signal or the signatures of the post 9 11 wars. But of course, this, the fear reaction led to preventive war strategy, a preventive war doctrine. And uh, preemption is a response to an imminent attack. What we've seen is a preventive war doctrine where you, you go out there and look for something that might occur. So the words failed us in Greek, but action did not. Numbers mystify rather than edify when they become very large. No single number or set of numbers can convey the reality of 9-11 or the events that followed, the world we've made, the paths we chose, the processes that we put in place, things we did not do because the United States and NATO were at war. But we can say a few things after the attacks in our long wars, we can say that Americans were afraid that when Congress passed the authorization for the use of military force on the 18th of September, 2001, just a few days after the attacks, the World Trade Center was still burning and the world was uncertain about the death toll. We can say that Americans were afraid and angry. Fellow citizens suddenly suspected because of their accents, their faith and their scarves the U.S. Patriot Act signed 45 days after the attacks in November 2001 is part of this, the domestic legacy. There are papers on the project that have talked about that the, the increased surveillance that um, Americans and immigrants faced and the inability to get sometimes into the United States. So uh, the reaction then to the post uh, to the attacks was um, institutionalized in the Patriot Act, in the authorization for the use of military force, in this system of preventive war. All of it due to fear, the fear that affected the way that we think, affected our cognitions and our understanding, and it's institutionalized in our bodies, actually, right now. So. Um, it's no surprise then that uh, we have this system in a way because we didn't actually spend that much time thinking about it. So um, what I wanna do now is just quickly run through some of the findings of the project at looking at this, this last 20 years of war. Um, the wars are, of course are more than locations on a map. 
the war on terror has taken a great toll in human life. And uh, it's cost a, a great deal of money. And the, the thing that you're looking at right now is the, the way we understand the costs of these wars. In particular, what the Cost of War Project has done is sort of break them down into something that's more comprehensive than uh, war spending by the Pentagon, overseas contingency operation or emergency spending. So that's a chunk of it. That's the DOD OCO top right quarter or so of total spending. And then if, as, as we've seen, the institutionalization of the post 9-11 wars of course is in the Pentagon's base budget as well in that it's gone up. And so you see this sort of pink wavy thing on the bottom, that's more DOD spending. And then in addition, there's State Department spending, a smaller chunk, and some of that goes to reconstruction, but not perhaps as much as you think. Much of the State Department's budget is spent on foreign military training and uh, other things that are actually supportive of the DOD mission. Then there's uh, the estimated um, cost of homeland security, and nobody knows exactly those costs. Well, we can talk about that, why, why that is later. Then the uh, cost of veterans care. And then because the post 9-11 wars uh, were built on borrowing rather than taxes, which is the customary way that one pays for war taxes or uh, the selling of war bonds, there's interest payments on the borrowing to pay for these wars. So then we also have the cost of veterans care and we look at it in two chunks. What we've already paid, the, the lower blue section here, the sliver of the, the total, and then this larger cost of future veterans care. I'll say more about that in a minute. Other work, other analyses, for instance, by Jason Davidson for the project um, has shown that the allies put in a great deal of their own treasure and not a small amount of blood. And uh, in fact, they suffered um, higher rates of mortality in the war zones than the US, but not as high as Afghans or Iraqi military and police. Okay, so here are the costs broken down by war zone. And um, the, the, what you need to, to recall is that we have to think about future medical care as something that, that we have, have obviously not paid yet, but we are obliged to pay. It's our promise to veterans. And this is my estimate of the, the, the three major categories, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, and then there are these other war zones which were represented on the map earlier. Okay, part of the thing that's not captured here is the human toll, uh, but I'm gonna get to that in a minute. What I wanted to talk about is the, 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 this uh, legacy of the institutionalization of fear. Here what we have is in the lower part, the base budget of the Pentagon. I talked about how it went up as a consequence of the war or the wars. And what you see here is the red part is the special budgeting that's for military spending for the wars by the DOD that Congress says, this is overseas contingency operation money. You're supposed to spend it in these, these post 9-11 wars. And then there's the base budget, which has gone up no matter in fact, what the war spending is. It's not working and, and it's not going in lockstep. You'd expect that as the size of the military fluctuates as some of the base activities decline. So the military spending has increased even in instances when the OCO spending has declined. That's kind of interesting. It tells you that there's lots of things that are going on um, and I'll, I'll just specify some of them. For example, defense health spending has increased. And that's because, as you know, many of the people who go to war come back different than they left. They're changed. Um, they have uh, musculoskeletal injuries. Some of them go back to war missing a digit or a limb. Um, there's a high tempo 
of operations. So military spending on, def on health has grown. And part of that, only part of that is paid for by the, the top part, which is the emergency spending. The benefits have increased overall for the military. And that's a part of the attract, keeping people and attracting new people because you've been at war so long. Often people don't wanna to go to a hot war. So you increase their, their um, benefits and bonuses are offered. And this healthcare system is part of that. Then um, here's a little graph and you can talk about it if you'd like to in the Q&A of the spending for the different war zones. You see the peaks for Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, Afghanistan is the little blue lower line for the most part um, in the beginning and then it um, increases. So there's the, you see the ignoring of Afghanistan in this chart uh, for a long period of time. Okay, and then here I said, we talk a little bit about death and he, here's a problem, right? Um, I have a very precise number for the US military, and that reflects our understanding of their importance, our understanding of their importance. And um, this number is actually not updated as of today's DOD number, but it's very close. It's down to this, the digit, the, 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 the first place before the decimal point, the, the ones column. All the rest of this, um, well, DOD civilians, we know something about. We know something about um, journalists and humanitarian and NGO workers, the small numbers. But the rest of this is an, uh, you know, an estimate. It's the work of many people trying to figure out what's happening in the war zones. And we don't have accurate, an accurate understanding. And it, this, these numbers also don't reflect. Yeah. OK. They, they, they also don't reflect indirect death. The people who are killed because of a lack of infrastructure, like uh, clean drinking water, or who become weakened because they've been forced to leave their home, they get a disease, they can't get to a hospital, and so on. So that indirect mortality is not part of this. This is a very conservative estimate of the entire cost of the post 9-11 wars in terms of human life, except for this, these, these numbers here, the journalists, the humanitarian workers, and the US military and civilian workers. So I would say that, that it's possible for this number to be much higher. Yes? What's in that category? Right. Are, are you going to talk about this a little bit? Oh, well, okay, um, I don't want to preempt what you're going to say, um, but I'll just quickly respond in that um, the United States post 9-11 increasingly turned to contractors to do things that sometimes the military didn't want to do. It's like getting people to come pick the fruit, right, in California, um, uh, kind of like that. So you, you hope that you're getting good value for money, but the contractors um, are doing things that are sometimes quite dangerous, like providing security or um, uh, running convoys, driving the convoys. So for instance, the convoys were attacked repeatedly going from Pakistan to Afghanistan and people died in that. And, and I, I don't have injuries here and I should. So um, it's not an easy task. Most of the people who die and, there, and some of the people in the humanitarian and NGO worker categories are doing similar things. Um, are nationals of the war zone, right? So they might be Afghan contractors or they might be um, Kuwaiti contractors working for the US war in um, Syria or Iraq or you know, uh, providing logistic support for the air power. So um, that's who these people are. That's why there are lots of them killed. Then um, other allied troops, as I said, mentioned before, Jason Davidson has shown that the, the, the other allies of the US, like the UK and Germany, uh, Denmark and so on, they suffered mortality rates that were higher than ours. So I want to um, pick up the pace since I'm prolix 
Um, then, let's, let's, just let me say a, a few more things about um, healthcare expenses and um, the injuries that are not mentioned here. So most of the people who are injured in war come back. 90, more than 90% of the people who suffer harm in the war zone are um, event, they, they make, they live. But this is why healthcare expenses have increased because the people who survive in the war zones are more injured, more sick than those who um, uh, were in the survivors of previous wars. So finally, um, the cost of war project, uh, I talk a little bit about in one of my papers, my pet project, which is US um, military greenhouse gas emissions. And what you see here is DOD and total US federal government energy consumption. And, they, and, and this is, you can see from this that the DOD is most of the energy consumption of the US government. And here you see US greenhouse gas emissions, which were on a downward trend before the post 9-11 wars. These are US military greenhouse gas emissions. And then they went up afterwards, uh, after the start of the wars, and then they began to go down again. So um, that's just a sense of the kinds of work that people in the Cost of War Project are doing. And um, obviously, we, we have really just touched the tip of the iceberg here, because that, uh, war affects us in every aspect. So, Fini. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. Um, reflecting on the 20 20th anniversary of 9-11 this past Saturday, Moroccan-American writer, Leila Lalami, and you can see that <laughs> I, I read a lot of writers clearly, uh, in an op-ed for the New York Times wrote, if we are to never forget, then we must remember not just the pain and grief we felt on September 11, but also the aggression and violence that other, our government unleashed. So the impact of 9-11 wars, post 9-11 wars, in terms of the numbers of people killed and wounded as we, we saw from, the, uh, from uh, Dr. Crawford's presentation, but also the broader effects of conflict on society at large, um, social trauma, psychological um, as well, has been perhaps considerably more destructive or palpable in the Middle East. Over the past month, the media has turned a lot of its attention to what's going on in Afghanistan, of course, uh, and focus on, on the situation of Afghan women, uh, recalling the justification of US involvement in, in this conflict to save the Afghan women. Um, but so, so as we're moving to uh, the next presentation, uh, Dr. Al Ali, I wanted to ask how you have been working on women's activism and gendered mobilizations in, in Iraq, um, a country which in the current discourse has been, uh, we talk about it as, a, as an unfortunate side sidetrack of this US global war um, on terror. So can you tell us more about how, how the US wars both directly and indirectly affected Iraqi society and more specifically its lingering effects on women? Yeah, I'll try to do that in the few minutes I was given. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and putting this panel together, Stephanie. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, one of the, the main human costs of war uh, for me has been the dehumanizing of human beings, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. Um, I mean, Neta presented some figures to us, and I think that's one of the strengths of the Cost of War project, that it looks at, you know, the hidden cost of war in the US, but also looks at us trying to look at the human cost of wars in places that were directly affected uh, by the so-called war on terror. Um, so before saying something more specifically about women, I, you know, like to say something more broadly and remind everyone that by the time that the U.S. invaded Iraq or the U.S.-led invasion took place in 2003, Iraq had already been 
decimated radically through 13 years of the most comprehensive sanction system ever imposed on a country. And I think there's lots of collective amnesia around the sanctions period. Um, and so I, I think that it's important, you know, why we need to stress the specific impact of the last 20 years in the war on terror, we have to also remind ourselves that there is a history to that and there is continuity. And in the Iraqi situation, by the time that um, the invasion happened, um, Iraqi society had changed already rapidly. The infrastructure was already destroyed. And let me just take sort of, you know, one kind of moment in, in May, 1996, uh, I don't know if you remember Madeleine Albright, who was then the US ambassador to the end. She was asked uh, by 60 Minutes correspondent Leslie Stahl in reference to years of US led, led economic sanctions against Iraq. She was asked the following question We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that is more children than died in Hiroshima. And, you know, is the price worth it? To which Ambassador Albright responded, I think that is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. So this is the context against which the um, invasion took place. We had a situation where every month about 5,000 children died as a direct result of sanctions. Um, I am certainly uh, not a defendant of the Saddam Hussein Ba'ath regime. I, I've been very critical of it, as you know, many Iraqis. But uh, prior to the sanction system, it had a very robust health system. It had a very robust education system. Now, as the result of the invasion, when we look at death rates, and Netta was telling us that, okay, so there's one category where we have quite precise figures, but everything else you know, it becomes more difficult. Well, when it comes to death rates of Iraqis, it's extremely difficult and it's very contested. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list of, you know, figures, but I'm going with one, um, one research that was published by the quite renowned medical journal, The Lancet in 2006, and mind you, 2006, early days, so many more people died. So at that time, the staggering number of 650,000 Iraqis was mentioned. And, you know, lots of people would argue that there are many more. When you think about another very obvious sort of number in terms of human cost of wars, displaced people, there were about 3 million refugees, about half of them internally displaced within Iraq and half of them external refugees. Um, now, these are just these are kind of obvious figures, but I mean, what I, I've been trying to look at, you know, the kinds of developments and trends that are actually hard to quantify. How do you quantify the level of chaos and lawlessness and violence that became rampant and normalized at all levels? And I'm, you know, although as Yeva rightly pointed out, I mean, my focus has been on women and gender relations in Iraq when I speak about violence that, of course, cuts across society, most obviously sectarian violence. And I should say I'm not one of those people who say that everything was fine before 2003 and that sectarianism started in 2003. Far from it. There's a history of sectarianism. But what happened is that the U.S. institutionalized sectarianism. And it led to a civil war. It led to an increase in militarization. Uh, and gender-based violence became actually part and parcel of sectarian violence. So when you had a, a Islamist militia, whether they were Sunni or Shia, because when I speak about sectarianism, I sp speak about the tensions between Sunni and Shia. If a Sunni or Shia militia would move into the neighborhood, the first thing they would do is would announce that women were not allowed to go to certain places, they would have to wear certain clothes, and they would, <clears throat> they would police women's mobility and dress code. That cut across, and that's kind of just the sort of mild form of control. Now, there was a systematic turning of blind eye, the hands of the uh, US uh, occupation, in terms of women's rights. 
I mean, women's rights were not at the forefront as much as it was in terms of the rhetoric around the invasion of Afghanistan, but it was part and parcel of the idea of democracy and human rights. But the moment the insurgents started and the moment there were issues, that was the first point that dropped off the agenda. I mean, there were US generals who when approached by Iraqi women and you know, who were asking for help because there were, um, you know, there were lots of instances of kidnapping of women, uh, forced marriages, trafficking, and so on, on honor-based killings. I mean, the general struck their shoulders and said, we don't do women, right? Now, in terms of um, NGOs, I mean, it is true that following 2003, there was a mushrooming of NGOs, women's rights or NGOs funded by the US, but there was a very clear sort of neoliberal, neoconservative conceptualization of women's empowerment. So women's empowerment meant women leadership, women as business women, right? There was no attempt to actually link up to sort of much more bottom up local conceptualization of what women's empowerment means. And I should remind you that Iraq is a country that has a long history of women's education, women's labor force participation. When I visited my relatives in Iraq in 1980, I saw women truck drivers and women working at petrol stations. I mean, I had grown up in Germany and I hadn't seen that. Um, so, you know, there, it's not that, you know, this is a country where there's no history of that. In terms of political representation, I've often been told, oh, you know, but the US occupation brought women, women's representation, because in the new Iraqi constitution, there's a 25% quota enshrined. So 25% of all political representation should be women. And I have to remind my audience that it's despite US objection, because when a group of women went to then ambassador Paul Bremer, following a few months after the invasion and said, you know, we actually, we women of Iraq, we make up the majority demographically of the population. And we would like to have a 40% representation enshrined in the constitution. Paul Bremer looked at them and he said, well, we don't do quotas. You know, which was quite uh, interesting because when it came to ethnic and sectarian divisions, it was all about quotas. That's how the Iraqi uh, government council was established. I mean, I can speak a lot about, you know, uh, effects on law. There has been a shift towards much more conservative the personal status law that governs marriage, divorce, child custody and divorce. Um, we have seen an increase in militarized masculinities. And crucially, we have come full circle when it comes to authoritarianism. I mean, one of the aims was you know to get rid of an authoritarian leader to challenge militarism in Iraq and we know of course I mean the amazing work of feminist scholars across the world who have shown us that the more militarized this society is the more gender-based violence we see happening across the board there is a direct relationship between militarism and gender-based violence and the privileging of certain forms of masculinity, a country where at some point women and men were encouraged to work side by side with each other. And again, I'm in no business of, you know, uh, romanticizing the Ba'ath regime. It was a terrible dictatorship, no doubt about that. But when it came to, you know, gender norms in the 70s and 80s, when there was a, you know, there, there was a booming economy, the idea was that men and women work side by side, be educated, try to, um, you know, be involved in the labor force. So now, you know, we, we have a we have a definitely a shift to, towards much more conservative gender norms and uh, authoritarianism where political dissent is being punished again by um, imprisonment and sometimes death. And unfortunately, um, I'm going to stop here, but maybe we can discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. So next we have Dr. Pelletier and uh, 
perhaps you can, now we, we heard about some numbers, especially from Nita's presentation. So can you help us understand what these costs actually mean and what the opportunity costs, both past, past and future of these expensive wars are? Sure, thanks. I have a few slides, so I'll come up here too. Okay, so I'll um, fill in a, a few details to supplement some of what Dr. Crawford talked about with the, the full cost of the war. My background is in economics, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the numbers and federal spending on uh, the military and the militarized parts of the economy and uh, what, what our opportunities are that we are foregoing currently and in the future. Um, so if we look at the discretionary budget, this is the, the fiscal year 20, uh, 2022 budget, um, and the discretionary budget is the part of the budget that Congress makes decisions about each year. Um, so if you look, about half of it is for the Department of Defense military programs. Um, this year it was 47%, this big blue chunk. Um, it's a little higher than that if we include Department of Defense civilian programs. Um, and then if we uh, add some other parts that are related, the Department of Homeland Security gets about 5% of the budget, Department of Veterans Affairs, 7%. Um, and some of the Department of Energy uh, is uh, defense related, the atomic at, uh, activities in the Department of Energy. So now we get to close to two thirds of the federal budget, the discretionary budget that is related to the military. Um, for the sake of comparison, we have up here, the Department of State gets 2%. The Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA gets 1%. National Science Foundation, 1%. Um, so I put this picture up so we get a sense of how we're spending our federal tax dollars and how Congress is making decisions about federal spending year to year. Um, and these percentages haven't changed much over the past few years. Um, the, the, the military typically gets somewhere around a, a half of the federal discretionary spending. Um, and so the opportunity costs here, when we talk about opportunity costs and economics, it's what are we foregoing by taking the decision we're taking now? So the, the billions of dollars we're spending on defense um, in, in fiscal year 2022, it's a little over 700 billion when we include the, the um, uh, Department of Energy activities and uh, some other activities, it's, it's about 750 billion that we're spending on the Department of Defense and defense activities. Um, what are we not spending on? And uh, we can look at that in terms of, um, a couple different ways we can look at it. One is in terms of jobs. So I'll show this next. So when we think about uh, the political justifications for military spending, of course, we have the, the national security reasons for military spending, but often we hear that we need to keep military spending high because of jobs, because there are a lot of communities that depend on uh, either defense jobs directly or indirectly the supply chain of defense jobs. So uh, if we look at something, if we use what's called an input output model, this captures all the linkages in the economy. And so we can look at not just the, defend, the, the defense spending, but also how all of the manufacturers and service companies uh, supply goods and materials and personnel um, to the defense industry. And so if we look at a million, of, million dollars of spending in defense and in the supply chain for defense, that creates about seven jobs throughout the US. Um, and we can compare that same million dollars to other industries that are uh, presumably important to Americans. So if we instead spent a million dollars on clean energy, uh, including renewable energy and energy efficiency, or on infrastructure repair, we'd get about 10 jobs. So about 40% more jobs for the same amount of spending in clean energy and infrastructure compared to defense. If we look at healthcare, the job number is even bigger. It's about twice as many jobs uh, created in healthcare compared to the military. And education is even more than that, 15 jobs in comparison to, to, to about seven. Um, and part of this is because more of the jobs are domestic, more of the funding stays local. So military spending, a lot of it is flowing overseas. Um, for contracts overseas or spending by military personnel overseas. Um, whereas if you look at uh, you know, construction of infrastructure, that's uh, 
uh, a place-based sort of uh, investment and place-based sort of um, employment creation. Healthcare and education tend to be pretty labor intensive. So most of the funding goes to, to employ people as opposed to uh, em employing uh, capital. So uh, where the military is a very capital intensive industry, um, you know, tanks, ammunition, so on. Uh, education is a very labor intensive industry. So many more jobs are created for the same amount of spending. Um, so one opportunity cost we have foregone over the last um, 20 years is the opportunity to create more of these jobs in these alternative industries. Um, and of course, there are all the outcomes that we are foregoing um, by not investing in those areas. So um, I just picked out a few examples. So if we use the, the overall spending number that Dr. Crawford talked about, what we've spent so far in the post 9-11 wars is $5.8 billion. So that includes the, the war budget, the increases to the Pentagon's base budget, uh, veterans care, interest costs, um, and the cost of Homeland Security. And then there, there's an additional 2.2 trillion that we're obligated to spend on veterans care and benefits. But just looking at the 5.8 trillion we've already spent, over the last 20 years, that averages out to about 290 billion a year. So war-related expenses over the last 20 years, the US has spent $290 billion. What could we instead have gotten for that amount or less? Um, so the American Society of Civil Engineers um, puts out a, a report card each year on the state of American infrastructure. And they estimate that for $260 billion a year um, for 10 years, we could restore American infrastructure to a, a B average. Right now, many categories of infrastructure get a C or a D, um, including especially water and transportation. And so for less than we've spent per year on the, the wars, we could be uh, restoring infrastructure to a, a, a B grade. Um, if we look at one example for healthcare spending, and of course there are many examples, um, we could extend coverage to all uninsured Americans for about $149 billion a year. So about half of what we've spent on the wars on an annual basis. Um, education, again, many different examples I could have used here, but just one, if we subsidized pre-K for poor families, which is one of the um, uh, most reliable pathways out of poverty is uh, subsidizing or providing um, uh, pre-K, uh, $41 billion. So again, just a fraction of what we spent on the wars. And then uh, finally, green growth, uh, $200 billion a year, I'll talk about this briefly, um, could reduce emissions 40% uh, over the next 20 years. So I uh, worked on a project when I was at the University of Massachusetts at the Political Economy Institute, um, looking at reducing emissions for the US based on IPCC recommendations. And um, there we found that, that spending 200 billion, excuse me, 200 billion a year combination public and private funds would lower emissions 40% over 20 years. Um, so again, that's less than what we've been spending on the wars per year. And that would create those uh, $200 billion would create about 2 million jobs. Now that's the gross level of job creation. If we net out the job losses, if we took a shift from military spending into the, the green economy, we'd create jobs in the green economy, we would lose some jobs in the military, the net job change would still be positive. It would be about 600,000 jobs created. Um, and if we think about these job losses, um, there are, even though in aggregate, the job growth is uh, positive by a shift from military to green, there are individuals and communities that of course would be, um, would suffer from this transition. Um, com individuals and communities that work in or are dependent on the uh, military industries. And so one thing to think about is what's talked about is a, a just transition. So providing uh, income support and providing targeted investments and other community level support to areas that are dependent on military bases or areas that, are, uh, that have a high concentration of military industries, targeting green investments to those areas to create green manufacturing facilities, for example. Um, and I won't go into more detail there, but I, I can if anyone's interested in the Q&A. Um, so that, that's it for slides, but so 
what, what the, the kind of overall points I wanna make is that we have already forgotten opportunities to do some of these things and to create some of these jobs and to achieve some of these outcomes by spending as much as we have on the post 9-11 wars. Um, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the spending doesn't end. Um, there are, as, as we heard, there are obligations, future obligations for veterans, uh, for their healthcare, disability benefits, other benefits. There are future obligations for the interest costs. So the, the wars have been entirely financed by debt. Um, past wars like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, tax raise, taxes were increased, especially on the wealthiest Americans. In the George W. Bush administration, there were tax cuts at the beginning of the war. So these have been entirely financed by debt and we continue to carry the, the burden of that interest on the debt. And we'll be paying that off for years to come. So even with the withdrawal and the end of the post 9-11 wars, the financial burden remains. And the, one of the aspects of debt financing of the war is that it shifts the burden to future generations of taxpayers. So all of us in this room, <laughs> presumably all of us paying taxes in the US are going to continue paying for these wars for many years. Uh, right now, the federal uh, spending on interest is about 5% of all federal spending. So that's 5% of the, the, our, our tax dollars that we can't use for something other than interest payments. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that that's gonna increase to 10% by 2030. Um, so, uh, and then the, the last point about future spending is even with the reductions uh, of, of troops in Afghanistan, even with the presumable end of the post 9-11 wars, the defense budget is projected to increase over the, last, over the next few years. So the war budget might be going down, but the, the Pentagon budget continues to go up. Part of that is for weapon modernization. Part of that is expanding the nuclear arsenal. Um, and so without some major public pressure um, fighting against the millions of dollars of lobbying pressure by uh, corporate contractors who are profiting from these wars, um, Without, without some public pressure to reduce defense spending, it won't go down just because the wars are ending. So I'll end on that. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so the last question is, what is next? It is clear that it's, uh, that even the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan does not mean an end to the U.S. global war on terror. And as the cost of war project reported um, US is uh, conducting what it calls counter terror activities in 85 countries. And these range from drone strikes to on the ground combat and joint operations with foreign forces. So Dr. Savell, what can you tell us about how the war is going elsewhere and what we should look um, uh, for, what we, what we should think about uh, going forward? Uh, so yeah, thanks again for being here. I'll try to make my comments quick um, and make time for questions. Um, so this is a map that I've put together that shows 85 countries in which the US is conducting some sort of counterterrorism operation from between 2018 and 2020. Um, and this is an important uh, glimpse into how the post 9-11 wars are going to shift and, and continue going forward. Um, in particular, so the map shows different categories of activity. You can see drone strikes in the red icon, um, the kind of orange and gray blast icons are where there's been uh, on the ground combat operations or combat through surrogates. Um, the green is military exercises in partnership with other countries' forces. And the yellow is what I wanna talk about today. Um, it's, it's places where the US is doing training and assistance. Um, which, which sounds fairly innocuous, like kind of a helpful training other countries in counterterrorism. Um, and actually it's far from inoc the innocuous kind of help that it sounds. And the point that I wanna kind of hone in on today is how it's actually incredibly counterproductive and can intensify local conflicts and local violence in many parts of the world. Um, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm gonna illustrate this through a kind of a deep dive, a case study. I went to Burkina Faso just before the pandemic lockdown began. Um, and I did a, a kind of an investigation of what 
US military, they call it security cooperation, what that means on the ground and what effect that's had on the um, kind of growing conflict in the Sahel region, which is in West Africa. Um, and what I found was that after 9-11, the US began quickly expanding its footprint all across Africa. Um, again, as Nita was saying, the logic was preventative war. Um, they, the military calls, calls these undergoverned spaces where militants can potentially gain a foothold um, and, and you know, threaten the US and others. Um, so the US began establishing a network of bases and training and assistance programs and selling and donating weapons across Africa. In Burkina Faso itself, um, they, the US military started um, pulled Burkina Faso into its um, Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Training Program, the TSTCP, in 2009. That was before any security expert was saying that there was any kind of threat of militant violence in that area. Um, the US had begun in the, re in West, the West African region as early as 2003 when they were very, I mean, even the security strategists at the time were saying there's really very minimal threat from this area, but again, this logic of preventative war and let's go in and, and you know, kind of extend US militarism to these, these kind of um, under governed spaces. Um, President Bush even used uh, kind of centuries old racialized language to claim he wanted the US military to be ready to strike at any moment's notice in any dark corner of the world. And that's his exact quote. So we're talking about this, these kind of racialized tropes. Um, and uh, other analysts kind of talk about um, the, the, there's a kind of important incentive now for the US to maintain a geopolitical presence in the West Africa and across Africa to counter uh, the influence of Russia and China. And indeed, that does seem to be a really important motivation for US military presence there. And of course, there's a lot of natural resources in West Africa and other parts of Africa as well. So analysts will talk about that as, you know, these, these are kind of the factors that kind of went into the US going in and saying, let's do counterterrorism training before there ever was even a, close to a threat. What happened was um, you can track basically the US military funding that grows exponentially for Burkina Faso starting in 2009 um, up to the present day. And it kind of tracks that exponential growth tracks with the spending that the Burkina Bay military has done. So you can kind of see how they map onto one another. Um, and what I argue is that uh, what the US did through its narrative of the war on terror and its funding and the resources and the training and the political supports, everything that goes to prop up that narrative, um, set Burkina Faso up for the problem of terrorism when it arose to be addressed with a war paradigm approach. Because of course, there are many other ways that governments can address the problem of militant violence, including a policing paradigm, which is what the US often turned to before 9-11, um, including you know, addressing kind of the structural roots of people's grievances and the reasons why militants join, people join militant groups in the first place uh, in, in, you know, oftentimes rage at underdevelopment and, and corrupt elite and those sorts of reasons. Um, and what this has done has been incredibly counterproductive and intensified the violence. So basically the Burkina Bay government is cracking down and repressing an ethnic group called the Fulani. They're a herding ethnic group. They've been, um, they've been Muslim for centuries and they have always been at the margins of the state. And this, the Burkina Bay state has really systematically targeted this ethnic group as being the terrorists. I had a, a kind of army, uh, army spokesperson off the record tell me, you know, these guys, um, it's, not that all, it's not that all terrorists are, wait, it's not that all Fulani are terrorists, it's that all, terrorists are Fulani. And that's this, this kind of justification for, for cracking down. And, and so you can imagine the kind of rumors that fly at the local level and the ways that people use this excuse that this guy, this Fulani is a terrorist, he took my land, you know, it's a way of, of seeking local revenge. There's all these kinds of complicated uh, dynamics between um, herdsmen and pastoralists and different ethnic groups and, and um, different kinds of relationships dating back to colonialism that are at play in this, in this complex dynamic of the conflict. And yet the Burkina Bay government is systematically cracking down on the Fulani, armed in part 
with the help of the US, given this war on terror narrative as a justification for targeting this group. And what's happening is um, a, a civil society leader explained to me about 80% of those who join terrorist groups say that it isn't because they support jihadism, it is because their father or mother or brother was killed by the security forces. Um, so this is, what I'm saying actually is kind of funny because the, the, even um, the military and US Congress is beginning to recognize and explicitly say that the TSTCP has not only not met US objectives, but that it's been counterproductive. Um, in, there was a, a West Point article that came out a few days ago um, acknowledging that a major phenomenon contributing to the rise of terrorism in Africa has arguably been the rise in efforts to combat it. Africa is in some ways worse for the fix. Um, that's a direct quote from a West Point uh, journal. Um, so my point with this kind of uh, example of Burkina Faso is to say that as the US doubles down on what Biden is calling this over the horizon strategy of extending US military, well, he's really doubling down on what you can see on the map that's been, that began in the Bush era and has continued very consistently throughout successive presidential administrations. Um, that, that this is these, these kinds of, of terms like security cooperation and training and assistance, they're used in ways that actually are, are very, have incredibly negative and far reaching consequences. Um, there's, uh, when we talk about how these wars are gonna change moving forward, the role of defense contractors in Africa and Afghanistan and elsewhere is very important. There's growing CIA surveillance and drone strike capability. Um, there is There are programs that like the one I write about called the um, One, 127 ECHO program, um, which is a, a, a surrogacy program where US forces can kind of use partner nation troops as ways to kind of conduct raids and that sort of thing. Um, this doctrine of preventative war that began in the Bush era absolutely remains untouched and continues under Biden um, and, and is part of creating the very problem it ostensibly seeks to address. Um, so, uh, you know, in closing, I just say the work of the Cost of War Project is more important than ever in um, holding our government accountable um, and not resorting to the all too easy belief that the forever war is over. We need to continue to push the US public to think critically and ask big questions about this kind of foreign policy, why we're doing it, what's, you know, what are the goals and is it really you know, protecting Americans and other people around the world? And if not, what should we be doing instead? Thank you, Stephanie. So we do have uh, time for questions from the audience. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand and speak loudly. Thank you for this um, great presentation today. I'm Les Robinson. Um, here on campus, I'm co president of the Brown War Watch. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, and uh, in Rhode Island, um, I'm part of efforts to divest the state pension funds from war profiteers. And I just want to say that in citizen efforts to move uh, and, and these local efforts that we think can make a change, the information that the Cost of War program produce is just invaluable for citizen efforts. Uh, you know, out on the ground, um, citizens don't have this vast JSTOR uh, capacity. So to have this public facing scholarship is just integral to, to efforts like that. So thank you very much for all the work that you've done. Um, uh, in, uh, one of the questions I have, and it, and it sort of builds off the beginnings and endings sort of structure that Meta, you, you began with. Um, I, you cannot, um, you cannot, uh, hear a discussion about Afghanistan or Iraq without uh, one or two paragraphs down, um, a discussion about the threat of China um, and, and the Cold War paradigm. So maybe the, the end of the war, or we know that the, the further wars on terror will not end, but uh, has the Kosovo War program given any thought to how to track Cold, Cold War 2.0 or how to address? Because it's, it's my belief anyway that 
uh, I don't think the uh, military industrial complex would have given up so easily on this endeavor if they didn't have another another cash cow ready to go. So is this part of uh, the cost of war going forward? Uh, well, you raise an important point in a couple of senses about China. There's also North Korea to keep in mind as well. So we haven't been tracking that because they're not post 9-11 wars, but we, we have been tracking the growth in the base budget. And the base budget is all about these other threats as well as the nuclear modernization, which will be a couple billion dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, 1.3, I think, billion dollars by the time mm. they're, I'm, yeah, trillion, thank you, T. <laughs> I have trouble with my Bs trillion. and my Ts some days yeah. because, but this is of course an order of magnitude, trillion. Um, so that's about China. And then uh, because the Chinese have gotten more um, capacity to project power because of their bases in um, the Gulf and, it, well, there are one base in the Gulf and um, their um, increased operations in Africa, the United States is, has justified part of its activities uh, uh, there on that. Um, so we, we haven't got a systematic way of approaching it. And, and that's one of the questions that we're going to take up is, you know, how do we think about the rest of the, the pie? And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, what's ironic is in 2001, May 2001, President Bush and Donald Rumsfeld, of course, said that, um, you know, China's the threat, we must turn to China. And then they had to put that on the back burner uh, a little bit, you know, they, uh, but what I'm saying is that a lot of that preparation can, or that work continued, but now we're back to that. It, it never really went away. Can I add one? Can I add to that a little bit? Um, I just want to add, add a little bit um, because you brought up the issue of contractors and who's profiting from these wars. And one of the things that has happened in the post 9 11 era is a huge growth in contracting. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I, I had written a paper on it looking at the difference from 2001 to 2019, it grew 164%. Um, and now uh, contracting dollars take up more than half of the Department of Defense budget. And you saw earlier, I put up the Department of Defense gets half of the discretionary budget. Half of that is going to a uh, contractor. So a quarter of all discretionary spending is going to military contractors. Um, and so there, uh, you know, th th there's a reason to stay at war when they can, and then there are reasons to, to fear monger when, when we're no longer at war. And so, you know, part of the, the increase in the Department of Defense uh, projected budget for the next few years is for weapons modernization, is for um, expanding the nuclear arsenal, as Nita mentioned, and, um, you know, stoking fears of Chinese aggression, stoking fears of North Korea um, justifies increased expenditures on nuclear programs and weapons modernization. I just wanted to add that. Hi, uh, my name is Jake Lunsford. Um, I'm recently here to Watson. I'm a captain in the United States Marine Corps. I'm a uh, military fellow over here and I'm also a student in the MPA program. Um, so my question is, so the Cost of War Project is one of the most prominent and prestigious academic projects produced at Brown University. It has, it has international recognition. It is rut routinely discussed in military circles at all levels. It was recently referenced by the President of the United States in his speech about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Did we pay you to write this? <laughs> <laughs> because we're going to use that as, as our... Please do. Just stop right there, buddy. Please do. So in light of the project's prominence and the topic's importance, I'd like to get a sense of the dedicated staff funding and physical space that's been given to the project. I'd also like to know if the provenance of, the provenance of this project will continue within Watson. And my last question is, I'd like to know what dedicated links of collaboration exist between other parts of the university, like the Climate Change Solutions Lab, for instance. I can, I can take that. Um, so I am housed here at the Watson Institute, um, and Heidi is joining the Watson Institute as well, uh, starting October 1. 
So the, the Cost of War project, which was formerly housed both here and at um, BU, is now going to come entirely under uh, Watson's roof. Nita has an honorary appointment here as well now. Um, so um, we, we, you know, we've been given every, uh, you know, incredible supports by the Watson Institute and by Brown. Um, we couldn't run this project without all the people behind the scenes from, you know, Rebecca Rex, who does fundraising, to Karen Ball, who administers finances, to, you know, John Mazza, who's here today doing the, the tech. I mean, we we just rely so much on, on those people who are, you know, tireless in contributing to the efforts. Um, and, uh, and we've been given every indication that there's going to be a lot of support for us going forward. And we, um, we absolutely will, uh, you know, continue to kind of build partnerships, have a presence on campus um, in whatever ways we can. We, uh, we just appreciate everything Brown has done. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Hi there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, TJ Shanks, uh, I'm also a military fellow, I'm a national defense fellow, uh, also a um, active duty Air Force, um, C-17 pilot by trade. Um, but uh, I do wanna say, kind of echo everyone else's sentiments. Thank you uh, so much, not just for this forum, this opportunity, but for everything uh, that the Cost of War Project has already put forth and I'm sure will continue to put forth. Uh, like Jake mentioned, I, I concur with his assessment. Um, that uh, you know the, what you've produced and what you've put forth is being discussed at, at, at very high levels and within the Pentagon, and, and it's definitely appreciated. Um, kind of as, as a similar corollary, I've got um, just a piggyback to, to Jake's question. Uh, do you have any formal um, engagements? I know, um, uh, particularly Dr. Crawford, some of your presentation was talking about how it's very difficult to quantify sometimes um, the effects, whether it's um, uh, you know, the, the human effect or the ecological effect or the cost effect of some DOD operations. Um, could you could you discuss kind of some of that, you know, what kind of reception have you gotten formally from the DOD? Um, have they been, uh, uh, I guess, has there been any kind of cooperation with, with the DOD uh, formally? <laughs> um, okay. So I'd like to think that um, everything I produce is read very carefully by everyone, everywhere, all the time. <laughs> and it informs their decision-making. <laughs> I've come to believe that um, often it's not read. And um, except uh, in November, was it? Or October of last, was it 2020? the DOD decided to dispute my analysis of uh, airstrike caused deaths in Afghanistan, which was based on UNAMA numbers. And that's an old um, dispute. As you probably know, the United Nations has been tracking civilian injury and death in Afghanistan fairly closely um, since 2008. They have a system where they don't say somebody is injured or killed and by who, unless they can say, with verifying with three sources. They have uh, the Geneva Convention understanding of who a combatant is. A combatant is a person who poses no threat, does not engage in military operations continuously. Um, the United States DOD has said that they um, uh, dispute UNAMA's numbers and they dispute other numbers because they believe that they know better what people are doing on the ground given the their closeness to their activities um, and that uh, so they have a different conception of whether or not somebody is a combatant so they therefore have a lower number of civilians who are killed okay so um, they there's a little dust up there they said I was wrong and I'm like I used UNAMA numbers and so it's not me you're having the fight with but they've had this fight so they paid attention very briefly and then I got a call and I got an email and a phone call from SIGAR asking this, the Special Inspector General of, of Iraqi or, or, or Afghanistan Reconstruction asking for me to explain why my numbers are different than the DOD numbers. And we went, went through that over a series of emails and conversations. And so now if you look at the most recent SIGAR, they say 
And, and the cost of war project has this more comprehensive understanding of what the costs are. And that's, that, that was the end of that. So, um, but um, many people in the project have had uptake. It's not just the, the stuff related to DOD. Ben Suit, and uh, who's, who's written, and you, you can talk, if you want to talk about Ben Suit's work or, and I was also going to mention um, Linda Bilmes' work on, uh, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Ben Suit, who wrote a paper on um, suicide, has uh, gotten a lot of interest in veterans affairs, uh, on veteran suicide and, and also active duty suicide. He, he spoke with the head of suicide prevention at the, yeah. at the VA. Yeah. Right, right. And Linda Bilmes is a frequent interlocutor with the VA as well over price costs. Um, past, present, and future costs. And I, there's... I'll just say one more thing, which is um, just to sum it up, we we really try to um, actively kind of educate, um, you know, pe people with findings, including um, members of civil society, journalists, the media, but also um, Congress. And uh, we do a lot of kind of outreach to share our findings with um, with Capitol Hill and. Um, and they regularly kind of get news of our findings and engage uh, on different levels in, in meetings and stuff. So we're, we're very active and kind of trying to, to reach out to the policymakers. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, we'll pass you there. Uh, hello, thank you for this. Uh, my name is Zera. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute starting this year, and I've been following the work of um, Cost of War for a while. So thank you for all of this work. So I have a question that um, that how how do the numbers around displacement particularly get recorded? Because I, I work on Pakistan. I'm, I'm an anthropologist and historian. And um, Pakistan, of course, has seen internally displaced people. And it's in my research, it's been really difficult to track how who who counts as displaced and how they identify as displaced, because particularly in that region, uh, the formerly federally administered tribal areas, um, which were affected in the post 9 11 uh, period, there that's a you know a series of displacements, and so how people were moving in my own, which I, I don't do quantitative work, but in my experience, it was really difficult to establish who was who. Um, and I imagine that's just going to be compounded as the refugees um, come in, who from what I've heard so far, because it's also new, are also people primarily who are able to cross into Pakistan who already have networks. And so whether they register as refugees or not, is, is complicated. So I'm just wondering how you will approach the ambiguities of who counts as what when you count. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, the I don't actually know the, the kind of very detailed answer to your question. It was an anthropologist named David Vine who has done our calculation of displacement. It's 38 million people displaced by the post US post 9-11 wars around the world. Pakistan, of course, is included, um, as well as some of the other major and most violent conflicts in which the US has been engaged since 9-11. So 38 million, not just in and from Pakistan and Afghanistan, but Iraq and Syria, the portion of the Syrian conflict related to US involvement and, and others. Um, so you can look at his look at his paper on our site and find he, he gives a very detailed explanation of how he chose to include internally displaced versus refugees. Um, and, and, you know, the importance, I think, of his work is in, in putting a precise figure on something that's actually impossible to calculate very precisely is that it, it, it enables us to talk about the magnitude of this, this consequence of war in a way we wouldn't otherwise. And we got a headline in the New York Times about this. So it puts the issue on the in for the public debate in a way that if we didn't have that number of 38 million, uh, we wouldn't be able to do. Um, so, so that's what I have to say for the project as a whole. Um, and David Vine just did a really interesting um, talk about this on the Watson Institute podcast. 
just recently. So you can hear more about his methodology there too. Maybe, can I say something uh, in relation to Iraq? I mean, I'm also an anthropologist and I have had the same issues. So the number that I cited is a conservative estimate. And I mean, of course it's somewhat easier to track the external refugees, um, especially those who then registered um, and, you know, people who initially, of course, in the Iraqi context, you had hundreds of thousands who ended up in Syria initially um, and then had to <laughs> leave Syria when the war started there, uh, Jordan, uh, Iran, Turkey. Um, but then, you know, in the second uh, phase, you know, people trying to come mainly to Europe, uh, very, very few to, to North America. Uh, but uh, at least half of displaced people internally displaced uh, um, many ended up in the north of Iraq and there, yes, a combination of a very, very unreliable government statistics, uh, NGOs, humanitarian organizations. And so it's, um, I mean, we're working, you know, with, so the, yeah, so I decided to share a very conservative estimate, but I agree with you, it's impossible to really, you know, put concrete numbers. It's, it's, it's an estimate. So we are almost um, at the time, but if somebody has one more quick question, I think we can take it. Um, why the, uh, Just wait for the microphone, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, why the focus on Africa as sort of the next front? Um, it would seem if, if it's a proxy battleground with China that Southeast Asia, Philippines, that, that area would, would be uh, would be more of a focus. Um, so that same West Point article that I just quoted in my presentation, um, the new issue of their journal just a few days ago was called quote, 20 years after 9-11, the threat in Africa, the new epicenter of global jihadi terror. <laughs> So even as they were acknowledging that U.S. counterterrorism there has been counterproductive, they were calling for more and better of the same. Um, and, you know, I think that with my focus, my turn to Africa came after I made this map and I saw that outside the Middle East, there were far more little dots and data points in Africa than anywhere else in the world. And this goes it goes to you know, this kind of new Cold War type logic of competition with China and Russia, but it also speaks, I think, to these, these very racialized tropes that we have around Africa and, and how to relate to Africa and what, it, what threat means. Um, and, and so I think that, that you know, as the post 9-11 wars kind of move forward and the, you know, the military deems that that's the kind of next threat to pay attention to, um, we, we need to kind of interrogate the logics behind those actions more and better than ever before. Well, thank you very much to the panelists and for, the, for all of you who came today and watched this event. Please continue following the publications and the, the really important work that the Cost of War project is doing. And I hope to see you at the future events.